Chapter 14 of Humorous Ghost Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James McAndrew. Humorous Ghost Stories, selected by Dorothy Scarborough. Chapter 14 The Last Ghost in Harmony. By Nelson Lloyd. From his perch on the blacksmith's anvil, he spoke between the puffs of his postprandial pipe. The fire in the forge was out, and the day was going slowly through the open door of the shop and the narrow windows westward to the mountains. In the advancing shadow, on the pile of broken wheels on the workbench, on keg and barrel, they sat puffing their postprandial pipes and listening. For a partner in business, I want a truthful man. But for a companion, give me one with imagination. To my mind, imagination is the spice of life. There's nothing so uninteresting as a fact. For when you know it, that's the end of it. When life becomes nothing but facts, it won't be worth living. Yet, in a few years, the race will have no imagination left. It's being educated out. Look at the children. When I was young, the bogeyman was as real to me as Pa, and nearly as much to be feared of. But just yesterday, I was lectured for merely mentioning him to my nephew. So would ghosts. We was taught to believe in ghosts, the same as we was in Adam or Noah. Nowadays, nobody believes in them. It's unscientific, and if you're superstitious, you are considered ignorant and laughed at. Ghosts are the product of the imagination. But if I imagine I see one, he's as real to me as if he actually exists, isn't he? Therefore, he does exist. That's logic. You fellows have become scientific and admit only what you see and feel and don't depend on your imagination for anything. Such being the case, I myself admit that the spirits no longer haunt the burying ground or play around your houses. I admit it because the same condition exact existed in harmony when I was there. And because of what was told me by Robert J. Dinkle about two years after he died, and because of what occurred between me and him and the Reverend Mr. Spiegenail. Harmony was a highly intellectual town, about the last man there with any imagination or interesting ideas, excepting me, of course, was Robert J. Dinkle. Yet he had an awful reputation. And when he died, it was generally stated privately that the last landmark of ignorance and superstition had been providentially removed. You know he had always been seeing things, but we set it down to his fondness for hard cider or his natural propensity for joshing. With him gone, there was no one left to report the doings of the spirit world. In fact, so widespread was the light of reason, as the Reverend Mr. Spiegenail called it, that the burying ground became a popular place for moonlight strolls. Even I walked through it frequent on my way home from Miss Wheedles, with whom I was keeping company, and it never occurred to me to go any faster there or to look back over my shoulder, for I didn't believe in such foolishness. But to the most intellectual, there comes times of doubt about things they know nothing or not understand. Such a time came to me when the wind was more mournfuller than usual in the trees, and the clouds scudded along overhead, casting peculiar shadows. My imagination got the best of my intellect. I hurried, I looked back over my shoulder. I shivered, kind of. Naturally, I see nothing in the burying ground. Yet, at the end of town, I was still uneasy like, though half laughing at myself. It was so quiet, 
Not a light burned anywhere, and the square seemed lonelier than the cemetery, and the store was so deserted, so ghostly in the moonlight, that I just couldn't keep from peering round at it. Then, from the empty porch, empty, I swear, for I could see plain, so clear was the night, from absolute nothing came as pleasant a voice as ever I hear. Hello, it says. My blood turned icy-like, and the chills waved up and down all through me. I couldn't move. The voice came again, so natural, so familiar, that I warmed some, and rubbed my eyes and stared. There, sitting on the bench in his favourite place, was the late Robert J. Dinkle, gleaming in the moonlight, the front door showing right through him. I must appear pretty distinct, he says in a proud-like way. Can't you see me very plain? See him plain? I should think so. Even the patches on his coat was visible, and only for the building behind him, he never looked more natural. And hearing him so pleasant set me thinking. This, says I, is the spirit of the late Robert J. Dinkle. In fact, he never did me any harm, and in his present misty condition is likely to do less. If he is looking for trouble, I'm not afraid of a bit of fog. Such being the case, I says, I shall address him as soon as I am able. But Robert got tired waiting, and spoke again in an anxious tone, a little louder and rather complaining. Don't I show up good? says he. I never seen you looking better. I answered, for my voice had come back, and the chills were quieter, and I was fairly calm, and dared even to move a little nearer. A bright smile showed on his pale face. It's a relief to be seen at last, he cried, most cheerful. For years I've been trying to do a little hanting around here, and no one would notice me. I used to think maybe my material was... Too delicate and gauzy. But I've conceded that, after all, the stuff is not to blame. He heaved a sigh so natural that I forgot all about his being a ghost. Indeed, taken all in all, I see that he had improved, while Solomon had a sweeter expression and wasn't likely to give in to his old propensity for joshing. Sit down and we will talk it over, he went on, most winning. Really, I don't do any harm, but please be a little afraid, and then I will show up distincter. I must be getting dim now. You are, says I, for though I was on the porch, edging nearer him, most bold, I could hardly see him. Without any warning, he gave an awful groan that brought the chills waving back most violent. I jumped and stared, and as I stared, he stood out plainer and solider in the moonlight. That's better, he said with a jolly chuckle. Now you believe in me, don't you? Well, sit there nervous-like on the edge of the bench, and don't be too calm-like or I'll disappear. The ghost orders were followed explicit, but with him sitting there so natural and pleasant it was hard to be frightened, and more than once I forgot. He, seeing me peering like my eyesight was bad, would give a groan that made my blood curdle. Up he would flare again, gleaming in the moonlight full and strong. Harmony's getting too scientific. Too intellectual, he said, speaking very melancholic. What can't be explained by arithmetic or geography is put down as impossible. Even the preachers encourage such ideas and talk about Adam and Eve being allegories. As a result, the graveyard has become the slowest place in town. 
You simply can't hand anything around here. A man hears a groan in his room and he gets up and closes the shutters tighter. Or throws a shoe at a rat. Or swears at the wind in the chimney. A few spirits were hanging around when I was first dead. But they were complaining very bad about the hard times. There used to be plenty of good society in the burying ground, they said. But one by one they had to quit. All the old berries had left. Mr. Whoople retired when he was taken for a white mule. Mrs. Morrissey Clump, who once operated round the deserted house beyond the mill, had gave up in disgust just a week before my arrival. I tried to encourage the few remaining, explained how these spiritualists were working down the valley and would strike town any time, but they had lost all hope, kept fading away till only me was left. If things don't turn for the better soon, I must go too. It's awful discouraging and lonely. Why, folks ramble around the graves like even I wasn't there. Just last night, my boy Ozzy came strolling along with the lady he's keeping company with. And um, where do you suppose they sat down to rest and look at the moon and talk about the silliest subjects? Right on my headstone. I stood in front of them and did the ghostliest things till I was clean tired out and discouraged. They just would not pay the least attention. The poor old ghost almost broke down and cried. Never in my life had I known him so much affected, and it went right to my heart to see him wiping his eyes with his handkerchief and snuffling. Maybe you don't make enough noise when you hant, says I, most sympathetic. I do all the regular acts, says he, a bit head up by my remark. We always were kind of limited. I float around and groan and talk foolish and sometimes I pull off bedclothes or reveal the hiding place of buried treasure. But what good does it do in a town so intellectual as Harmony? I've seen many folks who were down on their luck, but never one who so appealed to me as the late Robert J. Dinkle. It was the way he spoke the way he looked, his general patheticness, his very helplessness and deservingness. In life, I had known him well, and as he was now, I liked him better. So I did want to do something for him. We sat studying for a long time, him smoking very violent, blowing clouds of fog out in his pipe, me thinking up some ways to help him. And ideas all us come to them who set some weights. The trouble is partly as you say, Robert, I allowed after a bit. And again, partly because you can't make enough noise to waken the slumbering imagination of intellectual harmony. With a little natural help from me, though, you might stir things up in this town. You never saw a gladder smile or a more gratefuller look than that poor spirit gave me. Ah, he says, with your help I could do wonders. Now who'll we begin on? The Reverend Mr. Spiegenale, says I, has all about all the imagination left in harmony, of course excepting me. Robert's face fell, visible. I've tried him, repeated and often, he says, kind of argumentative like. All the sign he made was to complain that his wife talked in her sleep. I wasn't going to argue, not me. I was all for action and lost no time in starting. Robert J, he followed me like a dog up through town to our house, where I went in, leaving him outside so as not to disturb mother. 
There I got me a hammer and nails with the heavy lead sinker off in my fishnet. And it wasn't long before the finest tic-tac you ever saw was working against the Spiegel Nails parlor window with me in a lilac bush, operating the string that kept the weight a-swinging. Before the house was an open spot where the moon shone full and clear, where Robert J. walked up and down, about two feet off the ground, waving his arms slow-like and making the melancholy groans. Now, I have been to Uncle Tom's cabin frequent, but in all my life I have never seen such acting. Yet what was the consequences? Up the window went, and the Reverend Mr. Spiegelnail showed out plain in the moonlight. Who's there? He called very stern. You had ought to see Robert then. It was like tonic to him. He rose up higher and began to beat his arms most violent and to gurgle tremendous. But the preacher never budged. You boys ought to be ashamed of yourselves, he says in a severe voice. Louder, louder, I calls to Robert J., in answering which he began the most awful contortions. You can hear me perfectly plain, says the dominie, now kind of sad-like. It fills my old heart with sorrow to see you all have gone so far astray. Hearing that, so calm, so distinct, so defiant, made Robert J. stop short and stare. To remind him, I gave the weight an extra thump, and it was so loud as to bring forth Mrs. Spiegelnail, her head showing plain as she peered out over the preacher's shoulder. The poor discouraged ghost took heart, striking his tragicest attitude, one which he told me afterwards was his pride, and had been got out of a book. But what was the result? Does you hear anyone in the bushes, dear? inquires Mr. Spiegelnail, cocking his ears and listening. It must be Ozzy Dinkle and them bad friends of his, says she in her sour tone. Poor Robert, hearing that, he about gave up hope. Don't I show up good? he asks in an anxious voice. I can see you distinct says I, very sharp. You never looked better. Down went the window, so sudden, so unexpected, that I did not know what to make of it. Robert J. thought he did, and over me he came floating, most delighted. I must have worked, he said, laughing like he'd die, a doubling up and holding his sides to keep from splitting. At last I've showed up distinct. At last I've some use in the world. You don't realize what a pleasure it is to know that you're fulfilling your mission and living up to your reputation. Poor old ghost. He was for talking it all over then and there and settled down on a soft bunch of lilacs and fell to smoking fog and chattering. It did me good to see him so happy, and I was inclined to puff up a bit at my own success in the haunting line. But it was not for long. The rattle of keys warned us. The front door flew open and out bounded the Reverend Mr. Spiegelnail, clearing the steps with a jump and flying over the lawn. All thought of the late Robert J. Dinkle left me then for I had only a few feet start of my pastor. You see, I shouldn't have hurried, so only I sung bass in the choir, and I doubt if I could have convinced him that I was working in the interests of science and truth. Fleeing was instinct. Gates didn't matter. They were took on the wing, and down the street I went with the preacher's hot breath on my neck, but I beat him. He tired after the first spurt and was soon left behind, so I could double back home to bed. Robert, 
He was for giving up entirely. I simply won't work, says he to me when I met him on the store porch that next night. A hundred years ago, such a bit of haunting would have caused the town to be abandoned. Today, it is attributed to natural causes. Because, says I, we left behind such evidences of material manifestations as strings and weights on the parlor window. Suppose we work right in the house, says he, brightening up. You can hide in the closet and groan while I act. Now did you ever hear anything innocenter than that? Yet he meant it so well I did not even laugh. I'm too fond of my pastor, I says, to let him catch me in his closet. A far better spot for our work is the shortcut he takes home from church after Wednesday evening meeting. We won't be so loud, but more dignified, melancholia, and tragic. You overacted last night, Robert, I says. Next time, pace up and down like you were deep in thought and sigh gentle. Then if he should see you, it would be nice to take his arm and walk home with him. I did think I had the right idea of haunting, and had I been able to keep up Robert J. Dinkle's spirits and to train him regular, I could have aroused a slumbering imagination of harmony and brought life to the burying ground. But he was too easily discouraged. He lacked perseverance. For if ever Mr. Spiegenair was on the point of seeing things, it was that night as he stepped out of the woods. He had walked slow and meditating till he came opposite where I was. Now, I didn't howl or groan or say anything particular. What I did was to make a noise that wasn't animal, neither was it human, nor was it regulation ghostly. As I had stated to the late Robert J. Dinkle, what was needed for hunting was something new and original, and it certainly catched Mr. Spiegenail's attention. I see him stop. I see his lantern shake. It appeared like he was going to dive into the bushes for me, but he changed his mind. On he went, quicker, kind as if he wasn't afraid, yet was on to the open, where the moon brought out Robert, beautiful, as he paced slowly up and down. His head bowed like he was studying. Still, the preacher never saw him. He turned, raised the lantern before him, put his hand to his ear, and seemed to be looking intense and listening. Hardly ten feet away stood Robert, all a-trembling with excitement. But the light that showed through him was as steady as a rock, as the dominie watched and listened, so quiet and calm. He lowered the lantern, rubbed his hands across his eyes, stepped forward and looked again. The ghost was perfect. As I have stated, he was excited, and his sigh shook a little. But he was full of dignity and sadity. He shouldn't have lost heart so soon. I was sure then that he almost showed up plain to the preacher, and he would have grown on Mr. Spiegenail, had he kept on haunting him instead of giving in, because that one night the pastor walked on to the house fairly cool. He did walk quicker, I know, and he did peer over his shoulder twice it, and I did hear the kitchen door bang in a relieved way. But when we consider the stuff that ghosts are made of, we hadn't ought to expect them to be heroes. They are too foggy and gauzy to have much perseverance, judging at least from Robert J. I simply can't work any more, says he when I came up to him. As he sat there in the path, his elbows on his knees, his head on his hands, his eyes studying the ground most mournful. But Robert, I began, thinking to cheer him up. He didn't hear. He wouldn't listen. 
just faded away. Had he only held out, there's no telling what he might have done in his line. Often since then have I thought of him and figured on his tremendous possibilities. That he had possibilities, I am sure. Had I only realized it late that night we went out haunting, he never would have got away from me. But the realization came too late. It came in church the very next Sunday with the usual announcements after the long prayer. As Mr. Spiegelnail was leaning over the pulpit eyeing the congregation through big smoked glasses. Says he in a voice that was full of sadness. I regret to announce that for the first time in 20 years union services will be held in this town next Sabbath. Sitting in the choir reading my music marks I heard the preacher's words and started for I saw at once that something unusual was happening or had happened or was about to happen. Unfortunately, says Mr. Spiegelnail, continuing, I shall have to turn my pulpit over to Brother Spiker of the Baptist Church, for my failing eyesight renders it necessary that I go at once to Philadelphia to consult an oculist. Some of my dear brethren may think this an unusual step, but I should not desert them without cause. They may think, perhaps, that I am making much ado about nothing and could be treated just as well in Harrisburg. To such, let me explain that I am suffering from astigmatism. It is not so much that I cannot see, but that I seize things which I know are not there. A defect in sight, which I feel needs the most expert attention. Sunday school at half past nine, divine service at eleven, I take for my text, and the old men shall see visions. How oh, I did wish the late Robert J. Dinkle could have been in church that morning. It would have so gladdened his heart to hear that he had partly worked. For if he worked partly, then surely in time he would have worked complete. For me, I was just wild with excitement and so busy thinking of him and how glad he would be that I didn't hear the sermon at all. And in planning new ways of haunting, I forgot to sing in the last anthem. You see, I figured lively times ahead for harmony. A general return to the good old times when folks had imagination and had something more in their heads than facts. I had only to get to Robert again and with him working it would not be long till all the old berries and Mrs. Clump showed up distinct and plain. But I wasn't well posted in the weak characters of shades for I thought of course I could find my spirit friend easy over the ridge. He just wouldn't come. I called for him soft-like and got no answer. Down to the burying ground I went and sat on his headstone. It was the quietest place you ever see. The clouds were scudding overhead, the wind was sighing among the leaves, and through the trees the moon was gleaming so clear and distinct you could almost read the monuments. It was just a night when things should have been lively there. A perfect night for haunting. I called for Robert. I listened. He never answered. I heard only a bullfrog a bellering in the pond, a whippoorwill whistling in the grove, and a dog howling at the moon. End of chapter 14 recording by james mcandrew san francisco california